In the history of Britain, there is no character more beloved and revered than the mighty King Arthur. His story is one of rags to riches, one of honour, chivalry, magnificent quests, true love, and the once shimmering jewel of Britain, Camelot. But as with all good things, the legends are also filled with tragedy, recounting tales of lost loves, lost battles, and a single mistake that would lead to the eventual collapse of possibly the greatest kingdom in history. In this five-part series, I will be taking an in-depth look at all elements that make up the Arthurian legends. From the great king himself, to the question posed to the Fisher King by Sir Percival, we will look at Merlin, Mordred, Guinevere, Nimueway, Sir Kay, Sir Lancelot, Camelon, Avalon, Caliburn, and all other characters, places and figures which form part of the legends, or at least most of them. Although I will try to be as comprehensive as possible, to quote every single source is impossible. The sheer scope of Arthurian legend in literature can fill an entire wing of a library. So, to keep it focused, the series will instead take from a few main sources. This will include Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort de Arthur, Geoffrey of Monmouth's Historium Regima of Britannia, The Vulgate Saga, and T.H. White's The Once and Future King. Other sources also to be included will be mostly historical, as well as the Mabinogian, Welsh literature, and key sources which are prevalent to a place or character. Also, to be clear, this series is not to prove or disprove the existence of Arthur, but will rather stand as a contained source for the stories and legends surrounding him. Whether he existed or not is not important to me, as it does not detract from the very real fact that he and his legends have left a deep impression on scholars, historians, mythologists, writers and readers alike. And so, with all of this out of the way, I welcome you to the romance and history of Arthurian legends. At the centre of the Arthurian legend stands the king. All stories diverge apart from Arthur. Without the king, none of them would exist. So to understand their stories, we must first know Arthur's. The classical conception of Arthur is the wise and noble ruler, the brilliant strategist and warrior, balanced out by kindness, goodness and love for his people. He is a perfect king. He ushered in an era of peace and tranquility, and built a castle that has become synonymous with prosperity, honour, virtue, peace, and an order of strong and worthy knights, Camelot. In this castle they held council at a round table, the very symbol of his kingdom which stood for unity and equality. According to legend, it was even Arthur himself who started the concept of chivalry. At this table, those values took precedence, and any who did not uphold them were not welcome. But the table was far more than just a symbol. From here, knights were sent out to fight evils, go on many a quest to save damsels, protect villagers, or defeat giants. They were the protectors of Britain, and King Arthur in all his goodness was their king, their ruler and moral guide. The first definitive account of this classical King Arthur can be found in the 1136 book by Geoffrey of Monmouth the Historia Regime Britannia, or the History of the Kings of Britain. Although Geoffrey of Monmouth is often considered more historical than romance, for the purposes of this video we will classify him as a romantic writer. Within the context of Arthurian literature, a romance is defined as a narrative written in prose or verse and concerned with adventure, courtly love and chivalry. Geoffrey of Monmouth's book has very much subdued these elements, but there is still an element of fantasy to be found, like with Excalibur. Geoffrey would claim that all this information was obtained from an old book which he had translated to English. Wherever he might have retrieved his information does not really matter, as his book would set the story of Arthur in near unbreakable stone. Arthur's story begins when King Uther raped the Lady Igraine. Disguised as the Lord of Tindergill, Uther rode into the castle and had his way with her. From this union, Arthur would be born. After the death of King Uther, Britain was left without a ruler. Nobility from several provinces gathered at Silchester to determine who would be their next king. They proposed Arthur to the Archbishop of Legions. Earlier in the story, Merlin also prophesied the coming of Arthur. He called him the Boar of Cornwall, and many believed it to be Arthur. The man was strong, a pendragon, and had proven himself in battle. And so by order of the Archbishop, the young boy was consecrated and made king.
After he was instated, Arthur turned his focus on chasing the Saxons from his land. The Germanic tribes had been pushing into Great Britain even before the fall of Rome, sacking and looting the homes of the Celtic Britons. The name Briton possibly comes from Brutus, a Roman who had first settled in Britain with his men after the Trojan War. But this new war Arthur would fight against the invading Saxons was to be remembered in 12 consecutive battles. Geoffrey of Monmouth took the information for the 12 battles from the book written by Ninius in the year 830, Historia Britannum. Here, in the words of Ninius, are the 12 battles in which Arthur fought. The first battle was at the mouth of the river called Glain. The second, the third, the fourth and the fifth were on another river called the Dubglas, which is in the region of Linnaeus. The sixth battle was on the river called Bassas. The seventh battle was in the Caledanian forest, that is, the battle of Caledon Quat. The eighth battle was in Gwynian Fort, and in it Arthur carried the image of the Holy Mary, the everlasting virgin on his shield, and the heathen were put to flight on that day, and there was great slaughter upon them, through the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Virgin, his mother. The ninth battle was in the city of the Legion. The tenth battle was on the bank of the river called Tribriet. The eleventh battle was on the hill called Agnet. The twelfth battle was on Baden Hill, and in it, 960 men fell in one day from a single charge of Arthur's, and no one lay them low save he alone. In most traditions, Arthur's knowledge, cunning and strategy would save the day each time, and through these battles his name would become synonymous with hero, and in each battle, Arthur would carry his mighty weapons with him. They included Ron, his strong lance, Pruin, his shield, decorated with an image of the Virgin, his golden helm, decorated in turn with a dragon, and of course Caliburn or Excalibur, the powerful sword crafted on the mysterious Isle of Avalon. The final battle would take place at Baden. In the grueling skirmish, Arthur would slay 430 of his enemies by his own hand alone, and with the help of his mighty sword Caliburn. Some resistance would follow. Certain kings or lords did not agree with Arthur's reign, but one by one they would either yield or be trampled under Arthur's might. He would continue his campaign and conquer Norway, Dacia, Aquitaine and Gaul. Furthermore, he would restore York to its former glory and would merge Ireland, Iceland, Gotland and the Orkneys under his govern. The city of legions would remain his base of operations, however it is unknown where the city could have been. He would eventually marry the fair and beautiful Guinevere. The betrothal and marriage to Guinevere would cement his reign and begin an era of prosperity and peace. But Arthur was not quite done. He started inviting distinguished men from many different kingdoms to join him in keeping Europe safe from evils. These were all strong and talented, fierce men. To ensure they would not argue amongst themselves, Arthur opted to have them be seated by a round table. That way, no one was at the head and no knight was better than the other. This became a symbol for the kingdom of Arthur. Equality for all. The amount of kings King Arthur employed varies between stories. It ranges from 24 to a near impossible 146,000. But the round table, no matter how big or small it might have been, is a constant throughout the legends. After around five years of peace, Arthur's nephew Mordred, who was the son of Arthur's sister, Anna, came to his kingdom to join the round table and Arthur was happy to embrace the young lad and take him under his wing. When Lucius Hiberius from Rome demanded a tribute from Arthur's kingdom, Arthur took an outright offence. A demand and tribute meant that Lucius saw himself as a higher king than Arthur, and King Arthur was having none of it. He launched an assault and battled the Roman for many months in Gaul. Arthur would defeat him and finally return to Camelot, happy to have sealed his place as a great king. But upon reaching his beloved city, he discovered that Mordred had taken over his kingdom in his absence. He had claimed Arthur was dead and had married Guinevere. Arthur launched another assault, and the final battle would take place at the river of Camblin around the year 542, according to Geoffrey. Both sides would suffer heavy losses until finally only stragglers and Arthur and Mordred were still fighting. Both were mortally wounded in the skirmish. Mordred would die on the battlefield, 
but Arthur would be taken away to Avalon, a hidden paradise to never be seen again, but possibly to one day return when Britain needed him once more. This version is considered among all the earlier romances the most historical. Geoffrey had, after all, attempted to tell the history of Britain's kings, and although it has elements of fantasy, it does paint a clear picture of whom Arthur was and how he came to be in such an important figure in the history of Britain. For those familiar with the legends, there are some key parts missing in the story though. There is no real magic, no quests for grails, no sword in the stone and no betrayal from Sir Lancelot. It would only be in the 15th century when Sir Thomas Mallory, while stuck inside a prison for manslaughter, would write the most well-known and classical version of King Arthur as we know him today all encompassed in his book, Le Mort de Arthur, The Death of King Arthur. This book encompasses the entirety of the Arthurian legends, from the Sword in the Stone to the Lady of the Lake and even Morgan Le Fay. Most of these elements were in turn taken from sources like Merlin, written by Robert de Boran, and also the Vulgate Saga, written in 1210 to 1230, and believed to be written by Cistercian monks. They stand as firm sources for much of the Arthurian legends today. Mallory simply collected them all into one book. The Virgin of Mallory will be explored in part two, along with Arthur's history, where we will begin to take a look into more reliable sources for his possible origin point. Until then, thank you for watching, and be sure to check out our website, The Absurd and Fantastical, for more great articles.